James, the final word. Good evening, I'm Albie Oxenrunner, and welcome to the award-winning Final Word, the show that invites you into the conversation. This, of course, is the place to get your opinion on TV every Sunday night, and let's get started with tonight's three panelists. Please welcome, from the fan, former Pitt and NFL tight end, Doran Dickerson. Hi, Doran. Hi, Albie. Nothing like playoff golf, and we got that today. What an exciting finish to the PGA Championship. Got to love some playoff golf. Yeah, that was awesome. From our partner, DKPittsburghSports.com, welcome back, Dale Lawley. I'm limbering up the arm, Albie. I, I might have to go down and throw a few innings uh, at PNC Park because it can't be any worse. And from the Trib, also Steelers radio host, Tim Benz. Hi, Tim. Adam Wainwright wearing down the Pirates. Paul Goldschmidt, a four-hit game. Albert Pujols, two homers against the Bucks at PNC Park. Some things never change. Some of the topics we're talking about tonight, we're looking for five words on your thoughts on the Brian Russ contract. Are the Steelers better off long-term if Mitch Trubisky wins the starting job initially? What's the biggest hole on the Steelers roster two months prior to camp? Not considering the outcome of today's Pirates game, what are your thoughts on the Sunday leadoff morning baseball games? Plus, of course, your final word, but first, the night's big topic. In your opinion, what does Brian Rust and the signing mean for the possibilities of keeping Malkin and Latang? Doran, start us off. Uh, it, it's a good possibility, and I think it's a good contract. You know, they're heading in the right direction. Uh, you know, signing somebody like Rust, who is a, a very versatile player, and at the contract they got him at. But you know, people are enamored with stars staying with franchises, and and, and rightfully so. I mean, a guy like Evgeny Malkin, seeing what he has done throughout his career, what he means to Pittsburgh, it is awesome. But you have to start heading in the right direction. You have to start over. You have to start winning games, and that's what it's about. It's about compiling that roster that can be your future. I don't think Malkin fits. Maybe Latang does, but we'll see what happens soon. Dale? Well, to Doran's point, I think they, they need to, given what's happened here the last four uh, playoff series, you need some change. Uh, you can't just continue to run it back with these 34 and 35 year old guys. So, Rust was the guy that they had to sign. He was the youngest of that trio. Uh, he's the future. The other guys, you know, if, if you can bring him back on a really cheap deal that allows you to add somewhere else, that's great. But that's probably not going to happen. Tim? Well, I don't think one thing has to mean anything for the other in the sense that Brian Rust is not only about the present but also about the future. I mean, I guess in one sense you could suggest that because they kept Rust, they are leaning towards not blowing it up. But Brian Rust coming here at what amounts to, uh, I think, less than market value to stay doesn't equate to what they might have to pay to keep Malkin and Latang at the back end of their contracts where maybe they've gotten the most productive years out of them already. Uh, I don't think the signing of Rust necessarily for this number has to indicate or equate to a mentality of all three will stay. All right, a reminder, keep those comments coming. You can find us on Twitter at WPXI Final Word and on Facebook at The Final Word. And now it's time for five words. Give us five words on your thoughts on the Rust contract. From Twitter, Gary says, bring everyone back. Same result. Joey says, surprised he didn't test market. And finally from Twitter, good signing, once another cup. Doran, Dale, and Tim, five words on the Rust signing. And Doran, you're first. Uh, I just said this before, heading in the right direction. I think getting uh, Rust under contract at what they got him at, I think that makes the Penguins, uh, you know, set up for a nice little foundation of what they want to do with the future and the future signings. You know, he's a very, uh, very versatile player that can do a lot of things on the ice and obviously in the locker room too. He's a veteran player. He brings a lot to the table. I think that they're heading in the right direction with what they have done with Brian Rust Maybe, you know, we just talked about maybe they will bring back the other guys. But at this point, I think they've done right by themselves by getting rust under the contract. Dale, five words. Great deal for the Penguins uh, because he was signed under market value. Uh, they didn't have to go out and get into a bidding war for the, for the guy who's been their best scorer. And when I say score, goal scorer, you know, so I, I think you keep him in house and you'll see what happens with the other guys. But he was the key piece that you had to keep. Tim, five words. Makes sense for the money. Uh, I think if you were to lose Brian Rust to someone else, you probably would have had to spend just about that much to get a guy who can be either a first or second line winger anyway. I mean, 
Uh, I think if you look at average annual value, what he's coming in at is kind of the same to what Jason Zucker is. So that's a steal, in my opinion. And I think it's another differentiation from the Latang deals and the Malkin deals insofar as you could justify letting Malkin or Latang go because you might get multiple players to try to fill those roles for their cash layout. When it comes to Rust, you would just have to swap out somebody that you hope to be as good as Brian Rust for about the same amount of money anyway. He knows how to play with Sid. He knows how to play within the Penguin system. He knows how to be coached by Sullivan, knows the market, knows the division. You're keeping all that for what I think would be just about the same amount of money that you would have had to spend to replace him anyway. All right, everybody's going to get a quick chance on this. Tim, let's go right back to you first. How much, if you were the Penguin ownership, would you be willing to give for Evgeny Malkin? Uh, I mean, I'd be willing to give him if I'm going to keep him somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six million, but I don't know if they even want to do that. I, I think the time to try to find a newer, younger second line center is upon him. Dale? One million dollars. Uh, it, it, it depends. I mean, you're not going to pay, you don't want to pay a guy for what he's done for you in the past. You want to pay what he's going to do for you in the future. And I just don't know what, what Malkin's going to do for you in the future. Uh, you know, he's not what he used to be. Doran, quick thought on that? Yeah, I'm with Tim, around five to six million. Uh, you know, if I'm the ownership, I'm going to try to influence uh, Evgeny Malkin on the, uh, you know, the, the, the Pittsburgh angle here. Hey, you want to be here. We know you want to be here. You're a Pittsburgh Penguin for life. Uh, try to take a cheaper deal and stay here and play with your buddy Sidney Crosby. And he's not, by the way. Right. I mean, we, we, could, we could agree on what the number is, but I think we should also agree he's probably not going to stay for it. And maybe the tougher question is, what would you pay Latang? Because that number is still going to be high. Okay, thanks, guys. Still to come. Are the Steelers better off long term if Mitch Trubisky wins the starting quarterback job initially? Kevin on Facebook says, as long as one of the quarterbacks plays well, I don't care who it is. The final word will be back right after this. This is the final word. Welcome back to The Final Word. I'm Albie Oxenrider tonight with Doran and Dale and Tim. And are the Steelers better off long term if Mr. Trubisky wins the starting quarterback job initially, Tim? I don't think so. I mean, I think that the best answer to that question is you drafted a guy number 20 who's 24 years old. And the best thing for them would be that he's been Roethlisberger and he's ready to go uh, straight from the jump. That would be the best case scenario. I get the question because the inference is you get through those tough first six hard games on their schedule maybe and you kind of let Trubisky take the pounding there and then the rest of the team is up to speed and maybe it's a slow roll acclimation for Pickett but frankly I think the best possible scenario is he comes in wins the job is the best quarterback on the team and is good to go and then you've got a backup who's a quality backup like he was in Buffalo last year. All right, thank you, Tim. Let's go to Facebook. Brian says, you always want your rookie quarterback to sit and learn. The speed is so much different. It would be ideal that the way the Steelers have gone about business, especially with their active offseason signings and work, it's going to be the best man for the job. Doran, you're next. Yeah, I agree with that. You want your quarterback, your young quarterback to sit and learn, but I'm a proponent of you can sit and learn behind a guy who is a star. You know, I mean, we've seen it so many times uh, in the past, guys, even Aaron Rodgers sitting behind Favre, a situation like that. But I do think the Steelers are in a really good situation here. I mean, even us debating this, if Mitch Trubisky could be the long-term answer, or is it Kenny Pickett? I think Mitch Trubisky has a lot of good football in him, but they drafted Kenny Pickett to be their future. They drafted Kenny Pickett to be their starter. And if Kenny Pickett is ready during training camp to be the starter week one he has to be the starter because he is your future he is your team so they're in a good situation here regardless of who starts the beginning of the year all right Dale I think well that's true uh, what Doran just said I think ideally you know you, you don't want to rush your young quarterback in on into a situation I know everybody talks about Kenny Pickett being the most NFL ready quarterback in this draft class well, I'm here to tell you there's no such thing as an NFL-ready quarterback. Look at the guys who've been drafted number one and came in, in into this league and struggled, Trevor Lawrence being the, the latest one last year. You're going to struggle as a rookie quarterback in this league. They really made things easy for Ben Roethlisberger in his first season. He had a great team around him, and that really helped him have success. And, and he kind of got better as the year went on. 
you'd like to get those early struggles over with. He can watch and learn, watch Mitch Trubisky go through this. Mitch Trubisky has 50 career NFL starts. Kenny Pickett had 52 career starts at Pitt. There's a big difference there. And so I, I think the Steelers, for the long term, are better off if Mitch Trubisky wins the starting job. All right. Training camp starts in about two months. Between now and then, OTAs and minicamp. So it's a good time to look at the big picture, Dale. What's the biggest hole, in your opinion, on the Steelers roster? To me, it's backup running back. And the reason why is I don't want to see Najee Harris get 400 touches again this year uh, because he's just not going to survive the long term if that continues to happen. I'd like to see them have somebody there like a D'Angelo Williams who can take 100 carries off the plate or 100 touches off the plate or be your goal line guy or pick up some blitzes uh, you know, in, on third downs and things of that nature. We're playing 17 games now in an NFL season. To expect one guy to, to make it through a 17-game season at that position over and over again, even if you just keep him for five years, is not realistic. All right. We did get a vote for backup running back on our list of uh, tweets and Facebook posts. Now here's one, inside linebacker if Devin Bush is still bad. Tim, your thoughts? Well, a running back as a backup to Najee Harris would have been my vote as well. So I'll go in a different direction. Inside linebacker depth ain't bad. Um, I would say there's also a lack of a number one corner and a Pro Bowl tackle, but you're not going to get those at this stage. So an addressable hole that exists is finding this year's Melvin Ingram who actually wants to be here and stay and get a backup outside linebacker in case something happens to T.J. Watt or Alex Highsmith. All right. Doran? Yeah, I think Dale stole my notes. I mean, every single thing that I had down was, uh, you know, exactly what he said, a backup running back. And, you know, you, you want to limit the touches for Najee Harris. He's a young back. You don't want to run him into the ground. Um, in my opinion, you want a veteran third down back, a guy that could go out there and make plays, a guy that could actually go out there and be a sidecar next to whoever's at quarterback next to who, uh, Najee Harris, a guy that who could be on the field with Najee Harris to create mismatches. You need to find that guy here uh, uh, very soon if there's somebody out there, but I think it's very crucial to whoever's at quarterback next to who, uh, Najee Harris, a guy that who could be on the field with Najee Harris to create mismatches. You need to find that guy here uh, uh, very soon if there's somebody out there, but I think it's very crucial to address that so Najee uh, limits his touches and doesn't get run into the ground. All right, I've been told by Dean that we will launch a full-scale investigation into the note stealing. Uh, early start for the Pirates today. They were part of the Sunday leadoff on Peacock. Doran, not considering the outcome of today's game, which was very lopsided to say the least, what are your thoughts on the Sunday leadoff with the morning baseball games? No, I, I hate it. I, I really don't like it at all. Um, and it's not just baseball, it's even football. Whenever there's a, those international games, I forget that they're on TV. You know, you know, it, Sundays are my day to recover, my day to, 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 to get things going, to head into the week. I forget the, what the start times are. I'm all about consistency. I know football games are going to be at 1 p.m. every Sunday. I know baseball games are going to be at 12.35 or 1 p.m. Uh, you know, on the weekend. So I'm about consistency. I don't like the early start time. I don't think it does anything for the sport. People forget about it, and, you know, it's just – it, it, that's where I stand on it. All right. Joe on Facebook says, too early. Moving on to Dale. It was obviously too early for the Pirates as well. <laughs> they must have spent the evening uh, Saturday night on the south side uh, because they played like they were hung over today. And that shouldn't be the case for the home team in one of these situations, but it was for the Pirates. I'm not a fan of it. Uh, as Doran said, keep these things consistent. You know, you know what your, your, your Sunday schedule is going to be. Keep it there. Why change it? All right, Tim. Yeah, it's silly. I don't know who it's designed to help. I mean, what time was it then in uh, St. Louis? Or what if they have a, like, start a Rockies game or, you know, have a West Coast team out east? Well, you know, you're just limiting the eyeballs on the sets to watch these games to begin with. And, you know, people sleep in, people go to brunch, people go to mass, people kind of do their honeydew stuff early in the morning before it gets too hot out in a lot of cases in the summertime. I just I don't understand who they think they're benefiting or how they're benefiting by starting even earlier. There's a reason why you kind of roll these things sometimes at 135 on a Sunday anyway, as opposed to a businessman special at 1235. I just I think it's dumb. All right. Thanks, guys. When we come back around the horn on any topic, the final word is next. Welcome back. It's time now for the final word. Everybody gets a chance. Tim Benz, 
you're first. I know when it comes to NIL and the transfer portal and all that, you're not allowed to say anything but, hey, it's great because it's great for the athletes. It's fair for the athletes. Well, maybe it is, but there's two sides to every coin. For as much as we're applauding what this freedom of movement means for college athletes, let's also keep in mind that a lot of times when people transfer and late in the game, too, there are guys who are incoming recruits. There are players who have stayed at certain teams that are also now seeing their minutes, their playing time, their reps maybe disappear for somebody else who just decided they wanted a better opportunity not to leave a bad opportunity but to go to one that they just think is better so there are other athletes who sometimes are getting the short end of the stick besides because of the transfer portal because they decide to stay somewhere so this is a little bit of a two-way street or ask Keaton Slovis how he feels right now with Jordan Addison leaving and going to USC all right Dorian final word 1.2 percent 1.2 percent today was Justin Thomas's chances to win the PGA Championship heading into round four. Justin Thomas ended up winning the PGA Championship, coming back, playing some great golf. It was very entertaining. 1.2%. I mean, the odds, <laughs> odds of you winning are just obviously the, the numbers speak for themselves. I was happy to watch that, watch it throughout the day, saw the championship, seeing a guy like that come through and do what he did was unbelievable and unbelievable for the sport. Yep, great uh, day of golf. Dale, final word. You know, if I've been asked once in the past year, I've been asked a thousand times, what's going on with Stefan Tuitt? And guess what, folks? It's nobody's business but Stefan Tuitt's and the Steelers. The Steelers know what's going on with Stefan Tuitt. They're just not saying. And I've seen people out there saying, well, the Steelers need to cut Stefan Tuitt. They haven't done that. What does that tell you? They feel Stefan Tuitt is coming back to play. This, is a, this, this goes beyond football for Stefan Tuitt. This is his mental well-being presumably and if it's at if that's the case it's none of your business what's going on with it they trust him they trust that he's going to come back teams tell you what they're going to do by the moves that they make they don't necessarily say it and the Steelers did nothing to address that position in the offseason all right thanks everybody quick glimpse into the microscope of history this Wednesday is the 87th anniversary of Babe Ruth's final major league home run May 25th 1935 Ruth actually hit not one, not two, but three home runs that day at Forbes Field. First one cleared the wall, the second one hit the upper deck, and the third one went over the roof and into a construction yard off of Bouquet Street. That ball was retrieved by the late Dominic Wu Verratti, the same guy who 25 years after that, working as an usher at Forbes Field, is in the picture greeting Bill Mazeroski when he crossed home plate after the 1960 Game 7 World Series home run. Wu Verratti part of two monumental days in the history of sports in Pittsburgh. That's the final word for tonight. I'm Albie Oxenrider for Doran, Dale, and Tim. We'll see you next time.